Hello and welcome back to the Antarium. In today's video, we'll be talking about the trip we took down in South Texas last weekend to collect the Neopanera Velosa Queens. A fellow ant keeper down in South Texas was gracious enough to invite us onto his property to collect Neopanera. These ants tend to be pretty hard to get a hold of and not many people know too much about the biology on this side of the border. The primary tree that Neopanera are associated with as a host tree is mesquite. These are found throughout Central and South America, and of course, Texas has their own invasive set of them, and along here down the border as well. We arrived during daylight hours and began to inspect the property, looking at each tree, different types, looking for activity, and being they're more active at night, that we didn't see a whole lot, but we were able to scope out the entire area and know where to look once the sun finally came down. This here is a cavity inside of a mesquite tree, obviously an injury that's taken place well in the past. It's an ideal place to look for Neopanera. So we shined our light down here to see what we could find. The best places to look on trees like this for Neopanera are within the cavities themselves and around the edge of the tree where you might see some burrowing going down into the root system. Sometimes it's best just to sit and quietly watch. If they're within a tree, you will eventually see them foraging for food. And there she is. Okay, so we spotted a few workers so far, so obviously the tree is inhabited. This would be an ideal place to come back once the sun comes down and take another look. If you've never seen these ants in person before, just know they have a beautiful gold coloration to them. It depends on the lighting that hits them. It's a very, like a foil color almost. It's very beautiful to look at. They're also a ponderine ant, which means they sting, they're primitive, and they're very aggressive. So like most beautiful things in nature, it comes with a caveat to them. As we get later into the day, more and more ants start showing up on the tree, just kind of peeking out and looking for food sources, foraging around. And it's just an even better sign that we picked a pretty good tree to stake out. Of course, there are many others on the property we're scoping out as well. It'll be taking a look as soon as the sun goes down. Ideally, what we want to find due to the recent rain are queens that have already mated and are going around looking for places to nest, or they are foraging because they've already tried to found a colony, so we're trying to catch them in the act of foraging instead. Right now we're going to see some queens that are collected by our acquaintance down here before we arrived. He's already got a few that are in test tube setups and foraging areas. They're laying eggs. They seem to be doing quite well. Neopanera eggs are quite large, like a long rod. They're probably some of the biggest ant eggs you'll ever see if you're living in North America. Now we're going to take a moment to talk some morphology about ants. So ponderine in particular tend to be hard to distinguish between queens and workers because of similar sizes. So we're gonna stop and just take a look at a diagram I made separating all the sclerites, which make up the thorax. You'll see there are differences between the worker and the queen by separating the, parsing the pieces out. What you're gonna notice is the propodium, which is the very last section of the thorax and bees, wasps, and ants. She will have three distinct plated areas to the left of it facing upward. The worker will not have this in Neopanera. So while you might see workers that are very robust because they've been well fed as a larva and be almost as large as a queen and look like a thick thorax, so they don't have these plates, then it's not going to be a queen. Neopanera, like all ponderine ants, are semi-claustral as a queen. You cannot seal them in a test tube and expect them to have young. If you're going to keep them from the founding, you must provide a foraging area and adequate food supply. They are predaceous, they will hunt down, sting, and paralyze just about any small insect you can put in there. Neopanera also lack the ability to regurgitate food, unlike most ants that we're accustomed to. Because of this, you have to provide them whole food sources and open water sources that they can bring back to the nest in droplets or whole chunks. Naturally, the demand for protein will increase as soon as the larvae are present. The eggs take quite a long time to develop in this ant, so if you ever do start having these, just know <laughs> there's nothing wrong. They can be an egg for three to four weeks at times. It just depends on conditions. The larval stage is much shorter, 
And my experience has been about one and a half to two weeks, just with good warm conditions. And when they spin a cocoon, there's still a debate over whether they need substrate or not, but it's encouraged to have that because the nature is what they'd be using to anchor their cocoons. And they're also short as well, just like the larva compared to the egg stage. Now the sun's finally set, it's dark outside, let's go see what we can find. Here's a worker foraging, it appears to have captured some insect or caterpillar. Neopanera love grabbing caterpillars off of trees, and it's a really easy food source. Naturally, in our search for ants, we come across all kinds of critters once the sun finally goes down. Here we have the classic American cockroach. Next, we came across something rather unexpected, but of course we should have expected it, being that these are mesquite trees. So we came across a major of Cephalodes texanus. We excitedly looked around the tree after this, but unfortunately we did not come across any more than just this one major, which is playing dead in my hand. They're quite good at this once you disturb them. Turtle ants are very defensive, they're not aggressive at all. They'd much rather just make you think they're not there and just walk away when you're not looking. Here we have a larger creature of the night. This is a Maladon species. It is a Cerambicid beetle, so typically it's known as long bores or wood bore beetles and you'll find the larva actually boring through dead or dying trees. And in some cases, they're considered a pest. Some are invasive. This one, not in this case. This is native to this area. And the adults are just massive. They're like big tanks. You can just pick them up off the tree like I'm about to do right now. Just to make sure you don't get your fingers in front of those big honking chompers. As you can see, they are quite large. <laughs> there are actually some groups of beetles related to this that are so large, they've, they've said that you can actually snap a pencil in half between those mandibles. So always be careful when you see stuff like this. Respect the nature. If you're going to pick it up, be safe about it. And when you're done, just put them back because there's no need for you to keep bothering them. And here we have another great example of a Cerambicid beetle. It's much different looking than the previous one. This is a Lachmiocles species. And these are your classic longhorn beetles based on the antenna. The other one, they're quite short, but this is kind of the telltale feature that most of these beetles have that kind of distinguish them. In this case, they're actually horns just below where the antenna attach, which are distinctive for the genus I just mentioned. See, those got some big chompers, and they were near as big as a maladon. Like, this can give you a nip, but uh, the other one, you could probably get a much more of a pain out of that. And of course, when we're finished, we just put them right back on the tree where we found them. Target sighted. <laughs> we actually found a ton of queens out here throughout the night. Unfortunately, we didn't record every instance because we we're so focused on trying to grab the queens. But here's what it looked like, and here's the equipment that we used. I have a pair of these vacuums. They're provided by BioQuip, and they're excellent for medium to large ants. Do not use this to collect very small species or to collect brood. It's going to go right through that grid, and that's not what we want when we're collecting ants. As the night progressed, we just end up finding more and more queens. You watch along the edge of the tree, the tops, look for any kind of movement. And nearly every ant that we found isolated by themselves happened to be a queen that was foraging or perhaps had recently mated from the natural flight and looking for a place to nest. Based on this experience, I think they're actually fairly easy to collect. You just got to know where to look and be there at the right place in the right time. So look in the seasons, watch for natural flights, and know where the mesquite trees are. Out of all the queens we collected, only one was an alate. And we did find her beneath a rock with a queen that was already de-alate, which was interesting. The next few minutes of footage are really just going to be me showing you these ants walking around on these cups. Kind of give you a good look at them and all their glittering glory. And just to see all their features, how they behave, their shyness, their aggressiveness. They're just a really beautiful ant to stare at.
In case you're wondering how big these are, here's my finger for scale, in a sense. They're pretty big ants, almost a whole inch, between 0.75 and 1 inch, depending on their health and where they originated from. But it's massive compared to most ants you find here in North America, unless you're dealing with a really big Campanotus. Now one of the primary reasons why I went down to collect so many queens at once is because these ants do engage in primary polygyny. And if you're successful at this, you can have a multi-queen colony that can last for quite some time. These ants will form a polygyny based on a hierarchy with an alpha queen and betas. And they will fight to form this hierarchy, so you have to be careful in how you introduce them. The Alpha Queen tends to stay in the nest at all times, laying eggs, while the Betas perform more risky behaviors such as foraging. And these you'll find outside the colony more often. In the study referenced below, they found in the lab and out in the wild, these ants prefer to have two queen polygenies in nature, because they are the highest occurrence of any other group, as opposed to single queens and three to four or more queens. The study even showed that queens that were betas tended to leave colonies with a higher queen count to find ones with less queens because they have a better chance of reproducing. Having obtained a total of 13 queens, I am hopeful that we get at least one pair or more out of this group for a long-lasting colony to keep for display, education, and research purposes. In future videos, I will be updating you on how these ants are doing and hopefully we'll get to see actually pairing going on between queens. I'm also looking into using some night vision cameras to get footage of behaviors that typically no one gets to see because once you disturb them in the light, they do not perform those behaviors anymore. So look forward to that in the future as well. Also, for those still wondering, I am making the do-it-yourself videos. It's just taking time to do each step properly. Keep in mind, my process still has flaws in it, so it's not perfect. I want to present you an easy to follow, doable step by step that anyone can look at and try to make a nest from. As always, if you enjoy this content, please consider liking and subscribing for more, and you have yourself a wonderful day.